Hi, everybody, and welcome to CVS Health Live, our ongoing series that delivers timely perspectives and insights on healthcare issues happening right now. I'm Jessica DeMassa. I'm a health innovation reporter. And thanks so much for joining us today for what I think is going to be a very hopeful and inspiring conversation about a massive collaborative effort that's currently underway focused on ending the HIV epidemic here in America. So for me, this is like the ultimate end-to-end -end healthcare innovation story. This is massive. It spans a long period of time. It covers everything from medications to novel distribution channels, public and private partnerships, and so much more. For our purposes here today, we're gonna to focus specifically on a program that's being spearheaded by the US Department of Health and Human Services called Ready, Set, Prep. And this program, we're gonna jump into the strategy behind it, but this program is just one part of this massive initiative that's underway to help bring down the number of HIV infections by 90%, 90% in just 10 years. So let's get rolling. I'm so excited to introduce you to our panel. They are very excited about the work that is being done and can't wait to talk to us about the strategy behind it. So from HHS's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, we have the Deputy Director for Region 4, which I believe covers most of the Southeastern United States. Please welcome Lieutenant Commander Nellie Gazarian. From the National Minority AIDS Council, we have Damian Cabrera Candelaria. He is the program manager for the treatment division there. And last but certainly not least, from CVS Specialty, which is a division of CVS Health, we have Joel Helly. He is the vice president of physician services. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here Hi, today. Dad. Hi. Thank you for so having me. This us. is so exciting, and I think to kick us off, I'd like to bring our viewers up to speed on what is going on right now with the HIV epidemic in America. And so, Nelly, I'm going to ask you to kind of lead us off, level set for us, and tell us exactly what is going on. Because my understanding is that despite all of the advances that have been made in diagnosis and treatment and prevention and awareness, this is still very much an epidemic. So, can you talk us through that and explain? explain to us why that is such an issue here today still? Absolutely, and thank you, Jessica, for having us, and thank you to all the viewers of CBS Health for taking the time to listen in. And I'm very delighted to be on this esteemed panel with Joel and Damian, representing the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, or OIDP, from the OASH. And now that I've cleared up some of the acronyms to answer your <laughs> questions, we have made a lot of progress in HIV diagnosis. Back in the 80s, we saw about 100,000 infections a year, and we've had a substantial decline up until the late 2010. So our progress has, has sort of stalled off. Currently, we get about 36,000 new infections annually, and without intervention, another 400,000 Americans will be diagnosed over the next 10 years, despite the tools to prevent infection. And, and HIV diagnosis is no longer a death sentence. It can be managed through maintenance medications um, that are called antiretroviral medications. We also have PrEP or PEP, pre and post exposure prophylaxis that helps prevent HIV infection. Yet 14% have been diagnosed and only 18% of them that have an indication for PrEP are still are using it. And 56% of our people are virally suppressed. So now I know I threw some numbers at you, but behind those numbers are real people. They are our friends and family. And today we have the right data, the right tool and right leadership but we really have a lot of work to do, especially in our communities with the highest rates of HIV. 52% of them are diagnosed in the South, are African-Americans, Hispanics, Latinx. They're disproportionately impacted, MSMs. So we really have to look at the data to design effective programs. And biomedical interventions are only one tool in our toolbox. We have proven models of effective care and prevention with over 25 years of experience that we can implement while continuing to be innovative in our approach. So all this to say, Jessica, you're really right. It is still an epidemic, but we do have an opportunity opportunity to end it in, our, in the United States and now is the time. No, and I love what you said, Nellie, that behind all of those statistics, there are people. And so, Damian, talk to us a little bit about kind of the uneven spread of risk across different populations. So like most diseases, there are certain communities that are more at risk than others. So talk us through who is still most at risk and the kinds of factors that contribute to the risk profile of those populations. 
Of course. Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. I would like to start by saying that everyone that is sexually active is impacted by HIV. But as in any other epidemics, there are certain groups that are more affected or statistically overrepresented. And it does the case also for HIV, right? When we see the data, as Nelly was mentioning, for 2018, around 38 thousand new diagnoses were diagnosed in 2018. And among those, 69% were among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. And when we look at the data even further, we can identify, we can see that this is, in essence, a racial issue. Because the, most, the populations that are mostly overrepresented are Black, African-American men, and Latinx men, followed by white men. And I think that one of the main issues that impact these numbers is what we call in public health, the social determinants of health, which is basically those factors that affect the health outcomes of the individuals. And it can go from a macro aspect of the policies, the laws around HIV, the criminalization of HIV, to also to the access to employment, resource, economic resources, and also go to the community networks that are available to support these people. It is important to, to acknowledge that, just a, like an example, someone that doesn't have access to transportation, for example, or someone that is right now impacted by COVID that have no, no job, one of the main things that they're going to be looking at at this, at this moment is, you know, how to survive and not necessarily get tested and not necessarily engage in treatment. So those are the things that we can, we can see, especially in these populations that are deeply affected or disproportionately affected by, by HIV that are known to be already in disadvantaged position. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the, the challenge of like also tackling the HIV epidemic during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, Nellie, I want to come back for, to you really quickly. If you can get us up to speed on this program that's being rolled out by HHS, because it's very comprehensive. It, it covers everything from treatment, um, diagnosis, prevention, uh, the, whole, the whole gamut. So walk us through this real quick, and then we'll bring Joel into the conversation. Perfect. And you're right. You know, you mentioned the goals of the program to reduce them by 75% by 2025 and by 90% by 2030. It's really a cross agency initiative involving HHS and non HHS in agencies, CDC, HRSA, the Health Resources and Service Administration, NIH, Indian Health Service, SAMHSA, and even HAPWA that provides housing opportunities for people living with HIV and AIDS. And currently, what we're doing is focusing resources on areas where HIV transmission occurs more frequently. And the HIV data shows us that more than 50% of the new diagnosis occurred in 48 counties, D.C., San Juan, Puerto Rico, and seven rural states. So we're rapidly infusing sources here. And it is overall based on four pillars, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. So let's diagnose people uh, as early as possible. Let's treat them rapidly and effectively to reach sustained viral suppression, prevent new HIV transmission, and respond quickly to potential outbreaks to get prevention and treatment to people. So it's every single person has a crucial role to play in the ending the HIV epidemic and contribute to those filler, four pillars of EHE. All right, Joel, so tell us how CVS Health is contributing um, in, in its role um, to help kind of outroll this program. I mean, wh what are you guys doing beyond pro helping provide access to medications? Great. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here with me today, too. Look, I think it's in three buckets, right? The first bucket is around education and awareness. And we have 10,000 stores across the country with pharmacists in there that can help people with getting diagnosed, getting treatment. We have more than 40 sites that are specialty pharmacies, which means those pharmacists do HIV all day, pharmacists, technicians, et cetera. And they can help you know, anyone out there. What do they help with? You know, awareness about sexually transmitted diseases, right? Before we get started here. Education about safe sex practices, uh, uh, shared needle use, awareness of pre and post exposure, which is where the HHS thing comes in. And really this notion that undetectable is untransmittable, right? I think that's super, super important as we get there. Our relationship with HHS is the second bucket, which is access to, to drugs once, uh, once you've been diagnosed or pre. So for PrEP, we now work with HHS for patients who do not have insurance they still have access to PrEP. And I often hear people say, oh, I wish I'd be on PrEP, but I, I don't have insurance. 
there is access. All those pharmacists and those stores can help you to get that. If you do have insurance, you can get um, access through one of our mini clinics. There's 1,100 mini clinics across the country. And that's the third bucket, which is really the most important, I, think, I feel like, especially right now during the pandemic, right? So testing. Like we've learned so much about testing during the pandemic, right? It was been like that with HIV all along. We've been trying to get everybody tested who's at risk. Really, everybody should be tested at least once, right? And then if you put yourself at risk, be tested. Where do you do that? You can do it at 1,100-minute clinic locations across the country, first of all. Second of all, we also have a relationship, like Neely mentioned, with mobile vans that go around to the CVS retail sites and pull in there and you can get testing. Now, with COVID, that stopped, right? So we know that there's been hardly any testing going. All the prides that are going on, all the stuff that's been going on, that goes on every year has sort of ceased. So I, I worry that there hasn't been as much testing. Now, people aren't out as, out as much and stuff. So I think we really don't know. So I really was, you know, curious for Neely what you think in terms of that, in terms of testing. And, you know, we haven't been testing. We've been testing for COVID, not for HIV. Like, I want people to understand how important that is, right? Jump in, say more about that. Go ahead. I- Absolutely. I agree, Joel. And, you know, we have seen testing go down and, you know, we absolutely want to be COVID sensitive. And CDC back in May 2020 released a Dear Colleague letter that emphasized the importance of HIV testing during the pandemic. And one of the options available to the viewers out there is the self-testing HIV oral swab that you could do at home. So just know that that is available at your local pharmacy. So absolutely, Joel, all the pharmacists out there and, you know, all the experience that we have on this panel with Joel, Joel and I being the pharmacist, you know, Damian is here. It is very important to emphasize testing is really important even during the pandemic. Yeah, right, so we've learned is the good thing about COVID, if there's one good thing, we learned how important testing is. Right now, if we can take that and get all our, our friends who might be at risk to get tested regularly, we can really shut this down in the next 10 years, right? All right, so we've got testing in our arsenal. We've got medication in our arsenal. What else is there to help prevent new infections for HIV? I don't know, Nelly, if you want to kick us off there, I'm like, what else is is HHS focusing on in terms of the other ways to prevent? Perfect. And I'll go back to the four pillars because it's the, hopefully the viewers will remember going back, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. So if we're diagnosing people as early as possible and promptly linking them to care and treatment, emphasizing on the message of knowing your status, it's the first step really to help people make decisions about their health and wellness. And know that eight in 10 infections come from people that don't know they had HIV or knew but weren't in care. And we spoke about being innovative. Let us focus on expanding opportunities for diagnosis. And for instance, at pharmacies, because seven in 10 people with HIV saw a healthcare provider in 12 months prior to diagnosis, but were not diagnosed. And we spoke about the CDC self-testing earlier. In the treatment pillar, rapidly diagnosing patients with HIV, helping them achieve and maintain viral suppression and improving their quality of life as they age with HIV. Let's ensure immediate linkage to HIV care and support services. Make sure people are retained in care and re-engage those that have fallen out of care. And when we talk about prevention, and Joel led to this earlier, talking about the syndemics that surround HIV. Let's speak about HIV hepatitis STI and look at syringe service programs as a testing venue. Let's use that as a linkage to substance use disorder services, counseling, and education. We, of course, have PrEP and PEP, and one, more than one million people could benefit from it. And looking at states like California, and New York, and Colorado that are expanding the role of pharmacies, there's a lot for us to do there. Let's think about treatment as prevention for people who can maintain a viral suppression. Uh, There are social determinants of health that may inhibit HIV prevention and care, like poverty, housing, incarceration, language barriers, access to healthcare. And lastly, let's look at all the syndemics, but look at the communities that are disproportionately affected by infectious diseases, including LGBTQ, African Americans, Hispanics, MSMs, youth, people who inject drugs. So let's consider all of the factors in addition to the crucial role of medications. Before we go into a little bit more on the social determinants of health side of this and those, those communities that may not have access to some of these things, I'm hoping, Joel, you can back it up for us just a little bit 
it and explain a little bit more about the medications that are involved here, specifically around like, what is this experience like for somebody who's taking a medication either to prevent or taking a medication to treat? Like how much adherence, like how long do you take something like this? Like give us a, paint us a picture of, of what the experience is like for the person who wants to, to take these drugs and, and really what kind of commitment we're talking about here. Sure. So I'll start it off and I'll let Damian jump in too. So, you know, I think there's pre-exposure, which means prep, right? So now, and this is, this is a huge thing that you can take a pill every day. I think if we could do that for COVID, you take a pill every day and you'd never get COVID. You can take a pill every day and you'll never get HIV, right? And so I feel like when it first came out, there was a little bit of shaming and stuff going on as to whether or not you should go on prep and why can't you just be safe and why can't you do this? And what we realize now is if we put all these people who might be at risk from other people who don't even know they have the disease, we can slow and stem and stop these infections. And so I think, Damian, you had a great example, I think, of yourself, if you want. I don't know if you want to share. You can share it if you want to. <laughs> Joel, way to put him on the spot. <laughs> he, told me, he told me he wanted to, I swear. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> So uh, I actually wanted, wanted to expand on some, some of the things that you folks have been mentioning, specifically about education, because I think that the information is there, but there are certain barriers, like Nelly was mentioning, about language barriers. For example, I am from Puerto Rico, born and raised in Puerto Rico, so my first language is, is Spanish. And I know many peers here and in the States that don't necessarily get the information because they are either monolingual or because some of the materials are not culturally adapted to, you know, to address this, these populations. So that's one there. And also, I think that it is important to include the, the community, to hear the community. What are they saying? And base the initiatives based on their experience, based on their wisdom, based on, on you know, their feedback on, on things that can be improved. I can also say that uh, as, a, as a person that uses PrEP, I think that in, in my experience, I see PrEP as a tool to change our narrative in a sense, because as a gay man, we, there is a certain expectation around HIV in your life at some point. Like it shapes our experience as gay men. And I think that one of the, the huge takeaways of PrEP is that that narrative can be changed. Like HIV doesn't necessarily have to, you know, deeply impact my experience so that I can create my own path. But, you know, that path might be a rocky road because sometimes, as I mentioned, the information might not be accessible or even managing, uh, navigating the healthcare systems can be really, really challenging for some people. I think that the Ready, Set, Prep program has been great in addressing those specific factors and making sure that, for example, they, uh, the community is included in the advertisement that they do and the voices are included in, in those strategies. I, I love think, what you just said you about know, just, redrafting the narrative for gay men. I think that that is just such a beautiful sentiment. And I think, I mean, I'm going to pause right there because I just, I feel like they, that, that just should be commended. And thank you for sharing your personal experience with us. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about just broadening that access. So the second part of what you were talking about in terms of just making things approachable and understandable for, for folks who might not be, um, f their first language might not be English or for folks that might be in communities where they don't have access to particular resources um, or if they are, you know, somebody who doesn't have health insurance. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how how this specific program is hoping to kind of you know squash all of those those challenges that might be in the way from making this type of um, for, for making this redrafting of the narrative possible for so many people. Joel, I don't know if you want to kick us off on that. Sure. So you know, first of all, the access, like we talked about, is the most important part. Finding the right you know pharmacists or the right information. A lot of even primary care doctors don't have enough information about how to get started on PrEP, right? If they don't do that, that's not what they do. So you can go to a CVS or to a pharmacist and get some information. If I don't have insurance, go this way. If I do have insurance, go that way. I think that's important. And then secondly, you know, I think, and it's at no charge, right? Like there's some lab testing and stuff that has to happen. You have to make sure you don't have HIV before you go on PrEP. That all has to happen. But the drug itself, if you don't have insurance, would be free. 
If you have insurance, there might be a copay associated with this copay support. The pharmacist can help you to get additional copay support if, if you can't afford your copay even, because sometimes copays can be high in the specialty world. You can get it for zero. Most people pay zero for PrEP, which I think is important uh, to know. And then once you're on the medication, by the way, the even more important thing is that you take it every day. Right. And as the pharmacist in me says, we've got to make sure that people are taking it every day. No matter what your medication is, it's critically important in HIV, right? Because every day that you take it, number one, you're preventing yourself from getting it. Or if you have HIV, you're typically one once a day regimens, you're undetectable. And like I mentioned before, undetectable means you're untransmittable. You cannot give it to someone else. So if we have people on PrEP that are not going to get it, we have people uh, who are being treated, who are not going to give it to others. You can see the numbers come down and come down and come down. And then now today we have digital tools from your phones where it tells you, take your pill, because it's hard to remember, did I take it today? Did I didn't? The CVS app, the CVS Health, the CVS Pharmacy app can help you do that. Also reminds you like, it's time to refill your prescription so you don't run out of medication because you don't want to miss doses. When you do an HIV, the virus can replicate really fast in your body and come back really fast. And before you know it, you can out be uh, getting someone else sick. And by the way, some of these drugs, if you have a pattern of missed doses, it leads to resistance. So that drug might not work anymore. So it's extremely important to take it, you know, every single day. All right. No, Make I, sense? I, I, yes. I feel like I'm going on I, and on. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you're fine. I, I think, Nelly, I'm going to actually ask you to add to that because it's just like Joel is a pharmacist, you are also a pharmacist. And so I love the, the, the background that you have and that you're bringing to your role over there at HHS too. And so from your perspective, and I think like, I mean, anybody in healthcare knows it's like the pharmacist is one of the most trusted people in all of healthcare. It's like right after nurses, it's like the pharmacist is, is the next person that people trust the most. And so how has that, I guess, influenced the way that you've tackled your role within HHS specifically around this program? Like what kinds of learnings have you pulled through? Uh, th and thank you so much. And I do feel privileged to serve as a USPHS pharmacist as one of the 6,000 officers. And really as part of that, the community sees the pharmacist more frequently um, than any other healthcare provider. And when I worked in my previous role within the Indian Health Service, serving the underserved in North Dakota, it was truly the input from the community that drove the inception and expansion of a hepatitis C and HIV elimination programs there. So in essence, the past experience that I had has helped me excel at the current position and to share what I learned. The pharmacists really can truly end the HIV epidemic. So I know Joel and I are biased here, but we really can. Um, and as Maybe part of and as part of this initiative, the Assistant Secretary for Health established the PACE program, and PACE stands for Prevention Through Active Community Engagement, which stood up a team of PHS health officers in Region 4, 6, and 9 within HHS, and I'm here in Atlanta. We cover about 15 states and 30 uh, priority areas for EHEs, but we are freely here embedded within the community to help guide EHE programs that are tailored to serve, to serve the community. And as a pharmacist, we play a critical role in each and every of the pillars of EHE. If you can think of diagnosis, a lot of the pharmacies are clear wave. So let's go ahead and see how we can get into collaborative practice agreements, which I did at my previous site that, help, that helped me eliminate Hep C in that community. Let's talk about what we can do with prevention. Colorado, New York are all expanding the role of pharmacists. And also let's look at how we can make a difference with syringe service programs, even if it is a small token of just having a conversation with someone that walks into your pharmacy because we are trusted, because we see them so much. Let's step it up pharmacists and let's do more. All right, and Damian, I'll let you have an opportunity to maybe inspire and fire up the um, like the grassroots efforts, the community efforts that are out there. I mean, your role on the National Minority AIDS Council, I mean, that just proves, I, I think, you know, how important it is to have engagement, you know, at the community level, at at the, at the level of people to, to not only um, work together amongst themselves, but also to work with these incumbent healthcare organizations and the more organized uh, players that we have in the space. So yeah, all right, fire up the uh, grassroots efforts out there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I, I would like to say that organizations like, like ours, like EMAC, we feel like we are um, the gatekeepers of the community, right? Because we advocate for the community. And, and I am glad that we are included in panels like this. Because again, I think that if we miss that key of including the community on the table, the initiatives are going to be 
are not going to be informed, right? And, and I think that one of the things that we as, as the community, as organizations um, that advocate stress is that HIV has to be a social justice issue. It's not like any other disease, right? It's like there, we are seeing there are huge disparities based essentially on race and sexual orientation and also on gender identity. Um, so it, it's important to, even though it is a public health issue, to also make sure that we are talking here about making justice and about uh, making PrEP, PrEP and HIV treatment accessible to those that mostly need it. All right, you know, so how I, I just want to jump in real quick and stress on what Damian just said and how important it is. He mentioned that this is an, a public health issue, a social justice issue. And you're right, uh, Damian, this is a whole of society initiative. We really need not just the federal partners and organizations like yours and pharmacists. We want the, our state and county health departments on the table, professional societies, community-based organizations, our faith-based organizations, academic institutions. So everyone plays a big role role and it's a whole of society initiative. All right, last thing for you guys as we kind of wrap this up, I want to hear about how we build and maintain momentum through this. So the goal is to reduce the number of HIV infections by 90% in over the next decade. So how do we keep this momentum going? If you had to offer our viewers, you know, a piece of advice or a call to action of something that they can do to participate in keeping this momentum going for that long haul um, towards ending this, you know, what would you say? I mean, Joel, I'm going to start with you. I mean, I think the first things are around don't forget about safe sex and don't forget about not sharing needles and all those things that we never did before. Now we have some additional tools in our toolbox to help, right? And those are things like PEP and PrEP, pre or post exposure. And there's a whole bunch of new things coming along, right? There are injections that would be more convenient for some people once a month that might prevent you from or twice a month. And so as all these new advents come out, there's all these people that we can have protected from HIV and undetectable for those who have it. As we do that over time, the more education we can provide and make people feel comfortable taking PrEP, like everybody should feel this is a good thing by taking PrEP and not feel like somehow it means you're promiscuous or something like that. It does not mean that we want everyone to be on PrEP. We have to um, support the underserved communities. We have 10,000 stores across the country in all of those underserved communities where it might be hard to find or afraid to, to find the access to get PrEP. Go talk to your pharmacist in a store and say, how do I get this? Even if I don't have insurance. I think education is, you know, that like everything else, it's the number one thing we can do. And there's a lot of help out there that people don't even know that they have help or who to talk to. Even if your doctor doesn't want to do it with you, go talk to your pharmacist. All right, Damian, what would you add to that? How do we continue to keep the momentum um, as we move forward in terms of making progress on ending the HIV epidemic? Yes, um, adding to what Joel said, I think that we have to acknowledge in all the initiatives that we do that, um, again, that this, this is a racial issue and that racism is real and that it impacts not only how people access the services, but also question, do they see represented themselves in the healthcare workforce? There are many barriers on, for example, the, um, the social determinants of health that I was mentioning. If we don't address the economic barriers, the access to information, the access to, to uh, culturally adapted campaigns, we are going to be many, many steps to, you know, to engage people um, on PrEP and PEP and, and, and on treatment too. All right, Nellie, bring it home for us. <laughs> I, I just want to, you know, acknowledge that I know we're all living in difficult times and we see our communities that are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And to some of us in the HIV world, it, it, the story seems familiar, right? It, but despite the challenges facing us, I want to encourage everyone to remain resilient as we continue to serve those living or at risk of HIV. I want to encourage you to go and Google ahead. It's the dashboard that will tell you what the data looks like, your local data, what the epidemic looks like in your community. Go ahead and Google HIV.gov. That's another place where you can find the basic HIV information that the panelists spoke about today. But more importantly, if there's anything I want the viewers to take from today's episode and in classic Nelly style, I'm going to take you back to the four pillars, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. And you have a role to play in ending the HIV epidemic. Each of those pillars 
is important and what can you do in those pillars. It's a whole of society initiative. We want to hear this and it is an initiative by the people and for the people. All right, beautifully said. So we've got, don't forget the basics. We've got recast the narrative into next gen thinking around uh, reshaping this from a public health initiative into also a social justice initiative. And then we can't forget those four pillars. So thank you guys so much for unpacking all of this for us. If anybody is looking for more information on the four pillars, on the initiatives that are in place for this massive collaborative effort to end the HIV epidemic, you can check out cdc.gov slash stop HIV together. And you can also visit CVS's site, which is cvsspecialty.com. I want to thank our panelists so much for joining us and also for being so forthcoming and talking about this issue. I really think that, like I said, it's hopeful and it's inspiring and it really is kind of a, a new way of, of thinking about something that's been around for a while and it, it's hopeful in the sense that we can really make a difference over the next 10 years or even the next couple of years, uh, make a dent in making sure that nobody has to suffer from HIV uh, moving forward. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you too. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank Thank you. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next episode of CBS Health Live. Thanks so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm.